And our first speaker is Dr. De Freitas, uh, who is a climate scientist at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where he has been head of science and technology at the Tamaki uh, campus for and four years as the Pro Vice Chancellor. He has been Vice President of the Meteorological Society of New Zealand and is a founding member of, Austra of the Australia New Zealand Climate Forum. For 10 years, he was an editor of the international journal Climate Research, and he has three times been the recipient of the New Zealand Association of Scientists Science Communicator Awards, saying after my own heart there, and a Merit Award in Science Communication. As I've said in all the sessions, we see all these really flake fringe scientists that we have to listen to here. Uh, all these prominent scientists, excuse me. So thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is not simply as the title suggests, um, the Southern Oscillation, but uh, processes, or I guess more accurately mechanisms that drive and perhaps explain changes in, in mean global temperature. And I should acknowledge right off, have you got a pointer? No, do we have to no? know? I should acknowledge right off that this is a joint work with John McLean and uh, Bob Carter from <coughs> Australia. So um, what the research is about you can use the arrow if you do yeah, yeah, okay. is, is uh, the extent to which El Nino Southern Oscillation, referred to as ENSO, determines or is a metric for mean global temperature. It's the preoccupation with with global warming and the, the, the issue, of course, that we're all preoccupied with is, is, is the record, the trend in mean global temperature. So that's the context. The extent to which, uh, thank you very much. Okay, that's really great. The extent to which uh, ENSO forcing explains variance in mean global temperature has been the subject of, of work before, so this is not new. What is new is that we use uh, satellite data and uh, uh, balloon data, uh, radio sound balloons that soundings through the atmosphere that are much more accurate than the surface temperature record. In fact, we've heard from other speakers that the surface temperature record is, in fact, bad at best. Um, it, it's, and if you're working as we do as climate scientists on the atmosphere, we don't, don't really, we're not interested in what happens at, right at the bottom. We're more interested in, in the conditions through the the life layer of the atmosphere, which is the lower part, which is the troposphere. So our focus then of our research was on, as I say, the links between mean global temperature and atmospheric circulation, but with ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, being a metric for the circulation, and I'll explain it in a while, but looking specifically using highly accurate data. So the rationale then is this, where ENSO is a, a blunt instrument as far as circulation of the atmosphere is concerned, but it's a lot better than most other metrics we've got. So that was the starting point. So the aim then is very specific. We're not trying to prove or disprove the role of CO2 necessarily, but as you'll see, there's fallout from this. And in fact, within weeks of the paper being published, the blogosphere was alive with the sound of criticism. And I think it, it, was, it was an anticipation of us using this information or people, other people perhaps using this to, to um, suggest that CO2 is probably not as important as people think it is. However, that, in, that, that was not the uh, aim of the work in, uh, at the outset anyway. So just so those of you who are not familiar with the El Nino Southern Oscillation, it's a zonal circulation that is going from east to west. It's a, 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 a key part of the, of the atmospheric circulation because it's taking place in, in the biggest ocean in the Earth on, in the, that we've got, the Pacific. And of course, the ocean is crucial in an atmospheric process is because it's so large, it's 71% of the Earth's surface. Land is an exception, not the rule. And of course, the Pacific Ocean is, is virtually land-free. And there's large amounts of energy stored in the ocean, some 1,000 to 1,500 times more than the atmosphere. So we're looking at, if you like, the engine room of climate, or at least a, a metric for it, an indicator. So it's an east-west circulation system. 
And when it breaks down, when this circulation system known as Walker, Walker Circulation after Walker, the uh, British uh, meteorologist who worked in India, when the circulation cell breaks down, we have what's called an El Nino condition. Um, so really, what the, the key thing to keep in mind is that the, um, the, the well-behaved, or for uh, pedagogical reasons anyway, um, circa, Walker circulation breaks down. That is, is a, a part of the cycle. And La Nina is, in fact, a very, very normal situation. So you, you think of this as an oscillation. And of course, there's no such thing as normal in climate. It's a dynamic system, so it's always changing. So what we're actually looking at at first, at, 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 at first glance, anyway, is, is the variability of the system. But in fact, there's a lot more to it than that. Just a, just a point, what, what we don't have very good information on the behavior of this system, but what we do use is, 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 a, is the Tahiti-Darwin pressure differential, in fact, the standard, uh, standard deviation of the two. And, and the reason for that is that both of these stations have a very long record. So even though it's not a very, very good data, it's all that we've got. And in fact, when you think about a lot of, a lot of work that's done in climate science, we work with very poor quality data. It's only recently that we have good quality satellite data. But with, with El Nino Southern Oscillation, we stuck with it. And this is the index we use. And of course, you can see the logic here is that uh, it's, it's measuring either end of that Walker cell. OK, so here we've got it schematically. Here's the Pacific, massive area. If you take a Google Earth shot uh, and uh, arrange it so that you're looking down the Pacific, you see nothing else. It covers the whole hemisphere. It's a massive area of the Pacific. So we're dealing with a, this is not a regional phenomenon. It's a large scale, in, in fact, as you'll see, global phenomenon. And what we're actually dealing with is a part of the atmosphere, a part of this Earth's surface in the tropics. And 30 degrees either side of the equator, 30 degrees latitude either side of the equator, is about 50% of the Earth's surface. 50%. It's keeping in mind the shape of the Earth. And this is a very, very, very important part of the atmospheric system, reference to the surface, as Willis Eschenbach explained in a very interesting paper in the session before this. The other thing to keep in mind is that so far we've been dealing with this, what's called zonal circulation. But the very, very important meridional circulation, and this meridional circulation has its beginnings and end in this area. You see, I've got this circulation now is, is north-south. It's called Hadley cell circulation. Now, here we've got the, the Earth shown schematically. Here's equator, tropics, and mid-latitudes, poles. And you can see that there's the, either side of the equator are these Hadley cells. And the Hadley cells are perhaps the, by far the most important circulation phenomenon in the atmospheric circulation system. The Hadley cell is it. If you know what's happening in the Hadley cell, you can, you can understand and to some extent predict what's happening in the atmosphere. Now, keep in mind that up until now, we've been looking at uh, a zonal circulation taking place in this area. But this Hadley cell, as it turns out, is linked, we believe, to the uh, uh, ENSO circulation system. And I'll show you the link in a while. What I've done is superimposed a, a, a more orderly sort of a textbook explanation of this. And here you can see the Hadley circulation. And here's the subsidence, the exchange of energy from the poles, from the uh, equatorial regions to the poles. And that's, of course, what climate is. Climate is redressing this imbalance from an area of surplus to, to deficit. In this part of the Earth, it's, it's, it's cellular. It's a circulation cell going vertically up and down. Whereas in this part of the Earth, it's like a, mix, uh, like a washing machine. It's horizontal through frontal systems. So we're actually looking at this system when we're looking at ENSO. And here's a, a NASA, a NOAA um, rendition of it. Here's the mean state of the atmosphere. You notice we've got the Walker circulation here. And it tends to be messy. The meridional component of that circulation cell, it tends to be messy. It's, it's, it's prevalent because what is happening, you're moving surplus energy from the equator to the poles. But when we have a, an El Nino circulation, you notice the, the, the system tends to neaten up and tidy up. And what's happening is this Hadley circulation is enhanced. 
and it's moving energy more efficiently and more effectively towards the poles. And of course, that's what, remember, that's what climate is. Climate is the redressing of the imbalance globally um, across latitudes. And of course, this links in well, not only what Willis Eisenbach talked about this morning, but what Roy Spencer and uh, Richard Dick Lindzen talk about. It's, this is a key part of the atmosphere where I believe I certainly am a big fan of negative feedbacks, and um, I, I'm almost sure that Dick Lindzen and, uh, and Roy Spencer are 100% correct in their um, explanations or speculations about what's happening in this area. And I think um, the, uh, the, the data will come in to, to, sh to shore this up. So we're looking at a very important part of the Earth's system. What we used, there were two, two data sets for, for mean global temperature. The first was the, the satellite data, the Spencer uh, Christie microwave sounding unit uh, data out of the University of Huntsville, Alabama, which is high quality and well archived and well looked after data. And very accurate, looking at that part of the atmosphere we're interested in, the troposphere, the lower part of the atmosphere, not in a, in a white box at the surface. So we have good quality data. And that's what hopefully makes our work a bit different to its predecessors. However, this, the satellite data begins in 1979, and that's a short period. So what we did, we supplemented it with, it, with um, what's called a Rat Pack data, which is radio sound data that has been um, carefully uh, quality controlled, which began in 1958. It's not spatially as, as detailed, of course, as the satellite data, which is very detailed spatially. You know, you can resolve it at a less than a degree lat longitude cell, if you wished. But it's high quality. So we, we had the first bit from 1958, 54 to 79, we used this data and afterwards that data. And we keep it separate, we don't mix them. And you'll see when the results are presented, we don't try to, to trick you by um, uh, mixing the data, we keep it separate. Okay, so the, what we're looking at, we are, we're using this data to get mean global temperature. Keep in mind that there's another set of processes or phenomena operating in this area, and they're volcanoes. When volcanoes, big uh, volcanoes erupt, they, big meaning ash goes up into, into the stratosphere, it has a profound effect on global climate. And in this part of the Earth, the part of the this zone of the Earth, there are several bi uh, big volcanoes, very powerful ones that did erupt. So it would be... Um, unwise to ignore them. And these are the, the four we, we took cognizance of, Aganga, Chichon, Pinotubo. And you can see based on ex explosivity index or dust veil index, they're quite large. So you'll see later on that we, in fact, were aware of these volcanic eruptions and took it into account when we were interpreting the data at that particular time or those particular times shown here. In fact, they, very conveniently, there hasn't been any significant volcanic eruption since 1991, so it's very handy as you'll see. We have very well-behaved, very high-quality data from 1991 onwards, or in fact, even prior to that. So what we needed first to do is that we, it's quite clear that if you have a change in global circulation, the effect or impact on mean global temperature is not gonna be immediate, there's gonna be a lag. And there's some debate how you go about um, uh, identifying this lag. But what we did, we used derivatives of the data and did correlations of the derivatives um, to find out when we got our best correlation. And this apparently passed muster with the statisticians. There's nothing wrong with this at all. Um, I, I'm, I'm confident of this. And keep in mind, the idea was only to identify the lag period. And the lag period has varied in the literature from some people say around three months. We found it was about seven. But you can see the correlation is pretty, pretty high in this zone. So we, we took the peak, and I think we've got a pretty accurate uh, idea of when that uh, correlation is strongest. So then when we relate mean global temperature to ENSO, or the Southern Oscillation Index, we lag, lag the, uh, the former, that is mean global temperature, by seven, year, seven months. And here are the results. Here's the now often now famous figure seven from the, our paper. And it shows the data, and to give detail, we've split it up. This is the Rat Pack data, 
starting in 1954. And the solid line is uh, uh, SOI, and the light line is the, uh, um, the uh, let me get this right, it's, it's the SOI is the dark line, and the temperature, the mean global temperature is the light line, consistently all the way through. So you can see there the, the association, the relationship between the light line and the dark line. You can see the events when there was a, you see there's quite a good coherence here. This is not statistically processed data, by the way. The people in the blogosphere fail to read the paper close, carefully. These are not processed data, these are the raw data. All that's been done is lagged. The SOI has been lagged. So th those who are bloggers here should relax when they um, ab absorb this. Don't, don't see it as, a, as, as any trickery at all. It's, this is the raw data. And you can see that they, the two behave very well over this time period. In fact, you can see here, I'm in a zero in, it's extremely, we almost fell off our chair when we saw this, um, collective chairs. And you can see that when there's a volcano, the eruption, the big ones, the, the relationship does break down a bit. But generally speaking, the relationship is a good one. Now let's have a look at the last period. And I remember I mentioned the last period was free of volcanoes. It's a period in which we have good data because of the satellite. So let's look at that part, the lower part of the figure seven. And you don't need statistics or mathematical models or anything to, sh to, to, to see that Southern Oscillation Index, which is a, a metric for global circulation, as I say, it, it's, a, it's very highly uh, linked or, um, to mean global temperature. So we have a correlation, but we also have a mechanism to explain it. This is not like CO2 and global warming, necessarily. This is actually a, a direct circulation control mechanism. And you can see that's an uncanny, the, the link. And given that our data, both the, the SOI data and the temperature data is, is, is rough, I mean, there's no such thing as a, a temperature for the Earth, and there's no such thing as a an SOI, these are human inventions. So they're very approximate of what is actually happening. But even despite that, you can see the coherence is, is, is uncanny. Now, at first thought, you think, well, it doesn't leave much room for anything else, like CO2 or solar variations. And the answer is probably yes, over this time period. It's, it, it certainly doesn't suggest there's much room for anything else. So then let's look at the implications of that. This is the uh, surface data record, which you've seen more times than you care to remember, no doubt. But this is the surface temperature record. We've got a cooling, a warming prior to the Second World War, a cooling and a warming. I like this representation from Thompson because it's not dramatic. It doesn't go right up. And you can see what happens here is that our period, our study period, is in fact to the right of this diagram, and, and you keep in mind, in 1976, something very specific happened, and it relates to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and it's known as the Great Pacific Climate Shift. And you notice that's what marks the start of, of global warming in 1976. Nothing to do with anything else but the oceans. And this is widely accepted among climate scientists. Now, the study period is this period here. Okay, so this is the temperature. And here's the ENSO component. Here's the Southern Oscillation over that period, 1950 to 2009. So let's look at both of these together. We'll put the climate shift in there, and you can see what happens. It changes from a sort of La Nina type prevalence to a Nino prevalence, prevalence. So you can see right away what I'm getting at. The, the warming is associated with this circulation change. Okay, so put both of these together. Okay, here we've got the, uh, the, the period that we are looking at to the, uh, at the top. And we've got various things here. This is the period of cooling from 1940 roughly to 1979, a 40-odd years of global cooling, even though CO2 is rising quite dramatically. And it's probably linked to circulation systems because of the prevalence of La Nina conditions. Soon as El Nino cuts in, or frequency of El Nino cuts in, you get global warming. A high frequency of El Ninos means global warming. A low frequency means global cooling. In the latter period, which is our current, it is a question mark. We can zoom in on that. 
It's strange, global warming isn't as pronounced, or in fact it's taken a holiday for the last 10 or 15 years. And you can see the, the, the traces here, but it's hard to know what's happening in this area, but it's, there's certainly a change going on, and there's some speculation that we're moving into a, a cool phase, perhaps, or maybe a period of, who knows, if it's anything like this, 30 or 40 years of cooling. So what have we got? We've got a lag between what is a forcing um, measure of atmospheric circulation of about seven months. During La Nina conditions, the zonal circulation is enhanced. The east-west circulation is enhanced, and the, whereas meronial circulation of the Hadley cell is weakened. During El Nino conditions, though, we've got an enhancement of that north-south uh, very vigorous circulation. And if you get a high frequency of B conditions, that is El Nino, you get global warming. If not, you get global cooling. And that's what, in fact, our results showed. So what it, it actually does show as well, and it's much more important than perhaps a lot of people realize, it shows that, it's, that the system is just not moving things around internally. It's more than just simply moving heat around because as, as Spencer, Linston, and um, Eschenbach have shown, the zonal, these uh, Hadley circulation, there's a massive change in global cloud cover. So if you've got cloud cover change, it means more incoming solar radiation is reflected and you change the energy state of the atmosphere. So it's more than just moving energy around. This is not just internal, sorry, internal variability. So quite significant from that point of view. And the implications are something that we didn't set out to, to, uh, to note, but I'll note it in this conference because provocation is, the, is, the, is, is what is generally the theme in, in this conference, is the provoke thought. Um, and then really what it shows is that the strength of the influence between uh, uh, circulation systems and mean global temperatures so strong and so persistent that it doesn't allow much room for things like CO2 or even solar variation. Thank you.